Thank you very much, Adrian, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vin Banj, as Adrian has just introduced us. I lead our data and cyber practice, and together with Sally Anero, who is a very senior member of our data team, we're going to look at some key issues in and around the data protection space. And you will see from the incredibly ambitious range of big topics we chose to cover today, uh, there's a lot for us to cover. So um, time might be limited at the end of the session, but if we do have time, We'll take questions then, uh, and certainly both Sally and I are going to be around for the networking sessions later on, so we'll be more than happy to talk to any comments or questions that you might have then. So we're going to try and cover three fairly big topics, um, and 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 so in a, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Sally, who's going to look at the ever-increasingly complex issue of navigating global data transfers. It's almost very difficult for us to have a stable slide deck on this. The changes come through almost on a weekly basis, thick and fast. So credit to Sally for, for bringing us up to date on the issue of global data transfers. I'm going to look at something that's relatively new, the new AI regulation proposal, which is going is, is gonna to mean a lot for this sector. And I'll talk around some of those key points that I'm sure we will be exploring again in time uh, as that proposal uh, advances. Um, and then the, the, the issue of cybersecurity. And I'm just going to look at some of the concepts, some of the key points, and some of the key observations we're seeing to help you anticipate and address cybersecurity risks. Again, huge topics. It's very difficult for us to cover very meaningfully uh, in the short space of time. Um, but we wanted to make sure we gave you that outline of what we're seeing in this space. And then I'm just gonna finish really as I wrap up the session with some final thoughts on the topic of data ethics and diversity, uh, a topic that not only is very close to my heart but and, and my other role within the firm, which is the lead on issues around race, ethnicity, uh, but also seeing how this is becoming a growing debate within the industry and also within society. But that's just a few final thoughts on that. So. Um, let's get started without further ado, and I shall hand over to you, Sally, to kick us off on navigating global data transfers. Perfect. Thanks, Vin. I've just uh, sent a, a control request through to you, so you should be able to. Brilliant. Thank you. Over to you. There you go. Excellent. So let's move on to the next slide. So, hello, everybody. It's good to be with you here today to talk um, about a subject that over the last 12 months has quite frankly, been challenging uh, for those making transfers of personal data of individuals outside of the outside of the EEA. This month has seen an important development um, in terms of managing compliant data transfers with the publication on the 7th of June um, of new European Commission standard contractual clauses, or uh, SCCs, uh, for um, personal data transfers. Um, and in the time I've got, which I appreciate is quite short, I'm going to briefly revisit the data transfer rules and the recent challenges to making compliant transfers. I'm going to touch on the new standard contractual clauses, the SECs, and how this development is important. Um, and I'm going to offer some initial thoughts around what is still very much an evolving approach to these new SECs. Um, it's worth Noting just to start um, that, um, and also just to be clear, given the current alignment between the EU GDPR and the UK GDPR, that where I talk about uh, GDPR, I'll um, you can take it. I'm referring to both sets of law, so um, just to, just to avoid any confusion about um, what I'm referring to. So next slide. So. So data transfers, what are they? Um, under the GDPR, there is a general prohibition on transfers of personal data of any individuals, data subjects, to jurisdictions outside of the European Economic Area, which don't provide an adequate level of protection for those transfers, um, unless certain conditions in the law are met. So this would include, for example, um, data subjects who are employees or uh, study participants or uh, patients or health professional um, contacts, HCPs, among others. Um, the GDPR doesn't define what is meant by an international transfer, although we can look to guidance from the regulators to help navigate this, um, including, for example, the Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO, 
um, uh, uh, to help sort of you know, work out what, where, what, when, and uh, where a transfer is occurring. From these this guidance, it's clear that where data is merely transiting, but it's not stopping. Um, it's not being subject to access or manipulation en route to a ultimate destination. That in itself wouldn't qualify as a transfer for the purposes of these rules. However, transfers to uh, a non-EA importing sort of end jurisdiction would be. So, for example, if you've got a, um, a UK uh, subsidiary, a pharmaceutical subsidiary headquartered with headquarters in the US and that US headquarters is receiving UK employee data, um, then that would be a transfer of that employee data. Likewise, perhaps if they had a CRO who was accessing um, data in context of a study and that CRO happened to be located outside of the, the European Economic Area, then again, that, that would be a transfer. It's also clear that data that's hosted within the, um, the, the EA, but that is, or the UK, but is remotely accessed from a non EEA location. Um, so it would, would also be a transfer. So for example, that would be because you know, it, it can be viewed and viewed from a screen outside of the EEA. So it's being processed outside of the jurisdiction in that context. And then another transfer um, consideration would be where there's an onwards flow of data. So for example, that example I gave before with the farm code of the HQ in the US, uh, if that HQ perhaps was using the employee service provider who was also in the US or in another non-EEA jurisdiction, then the provision of that data um, would, would, also be, would also be treated as a transfer for the purposes of um, these rules. So let's just move to the next slide, sorry. Okay, so transfers can be made where these are subject to um, European Commission findings of adequacy. Um, in practice, however, there are only a relatively small number of territories or jurisdictions that have the benefit of an adequacy decision from the European Commission. So, for example, it would include um, Canada or Argentina or New Zealand, among, among others. Um, notably, it excludes the USA because it doesn't have a federal wide uh, privacy law. It tends to take a more sort of state or sector specific approach to privacy controls, which um, has prevented it from getting a, a, a sort of a country wide adequacy decision um, for that reason. Uh, in the absence of an adequacy determination, transfers can also be made where uh, appropriate safeguards are provided, and that would include standard contractual clauses. Um, it would include binding corporate rules, um, where these are for transfers entered into between uh, a group of companies and subject to uh, regulator uh, approval for those, those um, defined policies and standards. Um, and then there are also um, there's also the ability to, to transfer on the basis of approved certification me methods or codes of conduct which have been approved by regulators. This is a, um, a new provision that the GDPR provided for, but um, at the moment we don't really have much in the way of um, regulatory approval for uh, certification mechanisms or codes of conduct. There's not a huge amount of traction in that area at the moment, so there's not, uh, not, not many opportunities to rely upon those mechanisms at this precise time. Um, use of standard contractual clauses or SECs to legitimise transfers was uh, originally framed under the old predecessor legislation, the European Commission Directive, and they've been legally recognised um, for continued use under the GDPR until they could be updated, replaced, repealed uh, with the new clauses that the Commission would develop um, and that were capable of, sort of properly reflecting the requirements of the the GDPR. So this has meant that the, the GDPR has always um, uh, intended for these SECs to be replaced and these, these historic SECs have always been living on borrowed time, to, so to speak. Um, transfers can also be made in the absence of adequacy determinations or appropriate safeguards under uh, certain limited derogations. Um, but again, these derogations are more for um, ad hoc or um, exceptions only cases and don't tend to offer much help for organizations in the context of those sort of business as usual um, data transfers. Um, I'm struggling with the, the uh, there we go. 
Um, looking back to July 2020, there was also another adequacy transfer mechanism, um, the privacy shield. And this was kind of that core enabling mechanism that enabled that kind of highway of transfers to certified US recipients who were registered under the, the privacy shield scheme. Um, however, in July last year, you'll be aware that this, this scheme was dramatically sort of struck down by the Court of Justice of the European Union. Um, the Privacy Shield scheme had been established as a successor to a, in a, a previous scheme, a, a, the predecessor Safe Harbor scheme, which had equally been invalidated by the um, CJU following action um, by a campaigner, Max Schrems, which kind of flowed from um, earlier, the earlier Snowden revelations, which um, I made clear, or I established that there were in practice insufficient protections for EU citizens where their data was being processed in or accessed from the US. Um, Privacy Shield, unfortunately, however, didn't ultimately, in material terms, provide any further enhanced protections that the uh, to safe harbour in that respect. So in 2020, the the kind of CJU struck again and, and, and invalidated the Privacy Shield. Um, the Court of Justice didn't simply invalidate the Privacy Shield, however, it, it also more generally assessed the viability of the other appropriate safeguarding mechanisms for transfers um, outside of adequacy decisions. Um, so that meant that it wasn't just um, the US, but any non-EEA jurisdiction not subject to an adequacy finding and where the law or practice in relation to um, national enforcement powers in those jurisdictions meant that there were perhaps overarching powers to demand or to access EU data, and that those powers would impinge upon the protections that the, uh, you know, the standard contractual clauses and these other safeguarding mechanisms were intending to achieve, and therefore their protections couldn't be guaranteed. Um, the Court of Justice did consider that the standard contractual clauses remained a valid mechanism for transfers. However, that determination was subject to there being restrictions, including the need for exporters of data to carry out an assessment of the adequacy of the protection of the importing jurisdiction um, for that transfer, considering both the laws and the practice in that jurisdiction. And where necessary, um, putting in place further supplementary safeguards where technical, whether it leads to technical or organisational in nature. So, for example, by way of contract or um, measures such as uh, um, encryption or pseudonymization um, relevant to specific transfers. Where it was not ultimately possible to address risks through supplementary, supplemental measures where these were needed, then, then ultimately transfers shouldn't be going ahead. So we then had this sort of following year of hiatus, in effect, where the approach um, on transfers was unclear. The, the guidance around what to do was sort of fluid and, and in draft form. Um, and regulators were themselves taking quite different approaches to uh, what needed to happen next. So uh, we could see that, for example, in the approach of the UK regulator, who perhaps took a sort of a fairly stand back and wait and see approach. Um, whereas the German regulators were quite proactively engaging with uh, data controllers in Germany and asking questions about what they were doing and the measures that they were taking. Um, and then, for example, in France, where we saw cases of action, for example, brought by some unions to prevent the processing of um, patient data in US provided cloud services. Um, so there was quite a, a, an array of different approaches and reactions to, to the, um, the CJU's decision. So for most of this, the CJU case, um, for most, sorry, the, the demise of the Privacy Shield um, has meant that unless there's an adequate jurisdiction that the data is being transferred to, and as I say, there aren't many of those, uh, the, the fallback position is the standard contractual clauses um, with the need to do importing country assessments and uh, the in, uh, application of any supplemental measures where there appears to be a, a continued risk for EU subject rights. However, to add to these 
difficult issues uh, and challenges, we also had the decision of the UK to exit the EU, which meant in the absence of an adequacy decision by the European Commission, the UK would become a third country itself outside of the EA, meaning that exports from the EEA to the UK would also need to be subject to this um, uh, prior assessment if SCCs were going to be used as supplemental safeguards. And uh, given the, there has been some, there had already been some criticism about the sort of the role of GCHQ and bulk interception powers in the UK law, uh, there was, you know, it's not a, a given that an adequacy decision would, would uh, be provided. Um, the good news is that um, it looks like an adequacy decision is in the final stages of being approved and should be with us hopefully um, any day. If there's an adequacy decision that's going to be made, it has to be made by the end of this month. Um, it's expected, however, that the um, adequacy decision that is made will be subject to continuous assessment, meaning that any attempt to weaken the UK GDPR um, could potentially lead to EC action and withdrawal of that adequacy status. I should add that for transfers from the UK to the EEA, on the other, other hand, the, the UK has recognised those types of transfers as, as being adequate. Let's move to the next slide, sorry. So against this background, we have the long awaited um, European Commission standard contractual clauses that uh, were published by the European Commission on the 7th of June this month. And the work to replace the existing standard contractual clauses starts now. So just looking at the timings, um, after we, organizations now have three months until the 27th of September to be able to still use the existing standard contractual clauses for new exports. After the 27th of September, so in three months time, any new transfers need to be used the new standard contractual clauses and any changes that um, any changes to processing that is covered by existing standard transfer operations under the old standard contractual clauses would equally need to be uh, issue trigger a requirement to use the new standard contractual clauses. For all remaining transfers covered under the existing standard contractual clauses where there are no changes, then these can continue to be used um, um, up until the 27th of December 2022, uh, at which point they will have the need to have moved over to the new standard contractual clauses. Now, breaking this down, three months is a very short period of time. Um, and therefore, it's going to be important for organisations to actually use this time to identify perhaps initially whether there are any immediate updates they want to be making to any sort of existing transfer um, transfers they are making under the existing SECs so that they can potentially extend their longevity for a further 15 months up to that, that um, after that September the 27th uh, deadline. The initial three months is also going to be important as a way of starting to prepare for working with the new standard contractual clauses from September. And the UK um, Information Commissioner has confirmed that it will also be issuing its own standard contractual clauses sometime this year, um, but it's not known when or how um, they will be aligned with the, the new EC standard contractual clauses. I mean, obviously, we hope that they will be aligned uh, as, as far as possible so that we can you know, help clients with developing common templates for, for transfers cross-border, both the EU and non-EU non transfers. So um, let's just let's just perhaps start by looking at some positives <laughs> uh, that we can draw from these new standard contractual clauses. Um, first of all, the new standard contractual clauses follow a, a modular approach. Uh, so not only do they include the, you know, the kind of the expected existing controller to controller and controller to processor clauses, but we now also have the long awaited um, Processor, 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 processor clauses, which allow easier flow down of uh, obligations from processors to sub processors. And we also now have a processor to controller set of clauses for use in cases where the controllers established outside of the uh, scope of the GDPR. Another potentially good point is that the controller to processor or processor to processor clauses, um, where they're used, 
then there's no additional requirement to also include the separate Article 28 GDPR processor clauses, unless um, the processing involved takes place within the within the EEA. Another good um, uh, element for the, the modular clauses is that they allow for multiple parties and also include docking clauses. Um, so uh, new parties can join without the conclusion of additional contracts, which would be helpful. Uh, and there are also um, you know, the ability for multiple affiliates to be you know, uh, parties to um, a single transfer contract. There's also some flexibility as to the choice of exporter um, jurisdiction. So you can either go with the exporter's own EU jurisdiction, but there's also the option to use the um, another EU law jurisdiction, provided it respects subject rights. Um, I guess one other benefit from this kind of long drawn out hiatus as to what we do next after the CJU decision was it did also give the Court of Justice, sorry, the European Commission, the opportunity to perhaps seek to incorporate some of the requirements that will help address um, supplemental safeguards relevant to SHREMS within the new standard contractual clauses. So importantly, um, the parties have to warrant that the level of protection inherent in the law and practice and safeguards doesn't compromise the standard contractual clauses. Um, these clauses also include warranties around transparency with the exporter and there are importer obligations relevant to um, their interaction with any public authority in their jurisdiction around careful scrutiny of, of requests or minimization of disclosure and pushing back on requests to the, the fullest extent possible where, where appropriate. Um, the collected uh, body of European regulators, the European Data Protection Board, issued draft recommendations immediately following uh, the CJU decision on ways to assess the importing laws and practices of the of the um, uh, third part third country jurisdictions, and in implementing any additional safeguards for transfers. But I think these, uh, in, in their draft form, they were certainly seen as quite rigid and hard to apply in practice. Um, this position has evolved slightly with the new standard contractual clauses and with finalised recommendations from the EDPP, which appear to allow for a bit more flexibility around taking an objective risk-based approach and, and in recognising that um, assessments of importing jurisdiction law and practices should be uh, specific to the nature of the transfer rather than in general. This means that you know, transfers that are perhaps not subject to specific laws in, in that jurisdiction um, or that are unlikely in practice to be of interest to um, uh, importing country public authorities could be a factor in you know, helping with that wider risk assessment, but not factors in their own right. Um, on the downside, there is a lot here to do for exporters and importers, particularly in terms of documenting uh, assessments of non adequate importing jurisdictions law um, and practice, and also relevant to um, specific transfers. There's also, uh, it's also important because regulators will, uh, can ask to see this documentation um, of, of these assessments and, and of the uh, supplemental measures. Um, so importers of data will also need to help with this process so they're expected to provide information to help with these exporter assessments so in effect kind of like a pack of information relevant to for example where they're processing the data their sub processes and their assessments of the law um, there may need to be more specific notification of sub processes by importers to their exporters and and there will be more detailed requirements around the level of security information that will need to be provided. Uh, so the new appendices relevant to security have 13 different security measures where um, processes may be expected to have to provide more evidence against each of those. Um, one thing to bear in mind in that respect is I know there's been a lot of talk over this sort of hiatus period about the role of encryption um, in terms of as, uh, as being a safeguard for, um, supplemental safeguard for, for transfers and it's it's worth noting here that the standard contractual clause don't don't mandate encryption in cases where the purpose of the processing can't be fulfilled if it's encrypted so that's that's a helpful that's a helpful point to to note here so I'm just finally pull up the last slide sorry I'll get um so in terms of next steps well for organisations with significant transfers, 
this is a lot of work and the potential for impact on contract lead times is is quite real here I think as well um, so I think the earlier organizations can start planning for this the better and it would be important here as part of that to involve key stakeholders across the organization whether they are information security experts sales team legal marketing clinical or compliance they all need to help to the business with its process of getting to know and map its transfers in terms of verifying the transfer tools that are being relied upon identifying uh, in the case of the standard contractual clauses which module or modules are going to be relevant um, carrying out assessments of the law and the practices in place uh, uh, and documenting those um, and keeping them under regular review um, i've mentioned it will be necessary to switch to new standard contractual clauses either after september or by the 27th depending for existing contracts um, that may seem a long time off but um, for amendment exercises for certainly for remaining existing standard contractual clauses this is going to come around i suspect quite quickly for organizations particularly those with complex transfers um, where there may be hundreds or even thousands of contracts that might be involved so in conclusion i, I would strongly recommend not to delay this process too long where you need to assess your transfers um, we along with us are going to be working through the wider practical implications of these new SCCs and um, yeah, because I say we haven't had them for many weeks yet and we to do please look out for updates from us on this topic as well through our global data global data hub. Thank you very much Sally. So can I just double check that the slides are still up? So, Sally if you can give me a lost, up. We've lost them sorry. Vic. I know sorry. Okay. No problem. <laughs> no problem. Let me share them back up. They appeared again now. Yeah, that's great. Yes. Excellent. OK, super. So I'm going to fire into the topic of the new AI regulation. Um, so uh, on the 21st of April uh, this year, the European Commission published the long awaited proposal for a regulation on artificial intelligence, the AI regulation. The AI regulation is a first. It seeks to introduce a comprehensive and also harmonized regulatory framework for artificial intelligence, for AI. It also comes with a huge financial sting if you don't comply with it. So there are significant turnover-based financial penalties, and I'll talk about some of that as we go through the next couple of minutes. So let me just explore the scope of this for a moment. The scope of the AI regulation is broad. It covers and is designed to cover the life cycle of the development, the sale, the use of AI systems, including, for example, placing AI systems onto the market, putting AI systems into service, and also making use of AI systems. So it's not just about the system itself, but it's also how it enters into the ecosystem. And all those involved in undertaking these activities, whether as a provider, a user, a distributor, importer, or resellers, you will be exposed to at least some of the regulatory scrutiny that's designed under this AI regulation framework. This is also extraterritorial, extending to providers or users of AI systems who are located outside of the EU if they are placing AI systems into service in the EU or using the outputs derived from AI systems that are being operated in the EU. And you could already, I suspect, begin to see the parallels in the way in which GDPR as a regulation was framed an extraterritorial impact. And it's no surprise because this is designed to sit alongside GDPR, which is why we wanted to cover it in today's session. And the AI regulation is clearly and deliberately designed to complement and work, so it'll work alongside not only GDPR, but also several other existing legal frameworks uh, very relevant to this sector in particular. So, for example, the product safety and CE regime or the regulation of medical devices. And of course, as I mentioned, data protection under GDPR. And at the moment, this is a proposal, but we can very clearly see the direction of travel for regulating AI as we see what the framework is trying to do. So let me try and explore that a little bit further with you. What do the definitions look like? That's where we always look to as lawyers. What's the definitions? How do we really try and work out what's in scope and so on and so forth? The definition of an AI system is intended to be technology neutral, which is a little bit challenging when you're actually still trying to regulate technology. Um, so I suspect what they really meant to say was this is meant to be AI neutral. Um, but there you go. It's designed to be technology neutral and therefore hopefully 
from the draftsman's perspective, future-proof. And it's clear to see that there's a link here to the work of the OECD recommendations around the regulation of AI and the future of AI, if that's a piece of work that you've been following. There are key parallels between that work of the OECD and what we see in this particular regulation. So the definitions look at software and that software that is developed with one or more of the specified techniques and approaches as they are set out in Annex 1 of the AI regulation. And some of these approaches or some of these techniques include machine learning approaches, logic and knowledge-based approaches, and statistical approaches. So in other words, it's where software can, for a given set of human-defined objectives, generate outputs. Outputs are just content, predictions, recommendations, or decisions that influence the environment in which they interact with. So how do we try and contextualize this against the life sciences and pharma sector? So as you look at our regulation, it becomes clear that it does impact on the broader sector that we're concerned with. And we can look at some of those examples, particularly in the area of pharma, but also medical devices and health tech. Any AI that constitutes a regulated medical device or is used as a safety component of a medical device is under the regulation classified as a high risk AI system. And I'll talk about that in a moment. This is especially relevant given the huge growth of software as a medical device and the explicit reference to software in the definition of a medical device, particularly those used under the medical devices regulation and also the IPDR. Now, the developer of such a device, which the AI regulation refers to as a provider, has to comply with a whole framework of obligations and the requirements applicable to a high risk AI systems. And again, I will promise I will come on to that in a moment. Importantly, however, the EU proposal is for the requirements of AI systems to be checked as part of the existing conformity assessment procedures under the MDR, under the Medical Devices Regulation. So there's a lot of overlap between how this regulation and framework will work alongside other frameworks as well. The AI regulation establishes a comprehensive regime for both post-market monitoring and also market surveillance. And it makes clear that the market surveillance authority in each member state with responsibility for medical devices will also have competency in respect of market surveillance of AI in relation to those devices. So the regulatory environment in terms of oversight also begins to see the overlap. However, in addition, the AI regulation requires the creation of a new supervisory authority responsible for providing guidance and advice on implementation of the AI regulation across all sectors. So as far as pharma is concerned, AI systems already pay a noticeable part of the pharmaceutical industry, whether it's drug discovery, interpretation, analysis of clinical data, and, and the selection of patients for a clinical trial, for example. So it's important to note that as well as AI-based medical devices, some of the other uses of AI by the pharmaceutical industry may amount to this high-risk status, depending on the list of fields that's set out in the annex to the AI regulation. The annex is one that we'll need to be thinking about on a constant basis because it's subject to change as well. So for example, the processing of patient data can constitute biometric in, uh, identification and categorization of natural persons, again, caught by this high risk status. Also to note that pharma companies, like any other employers, could stray into this high risk territory when you're using AI for recruitment purposes or to make decisions such as promotion, termination, and just the general management of your employee base. If AI is involved, then again, you fall into that high-risk category. Of course, not all AI solutions uh, will fall into this high-risk category. Those that are otherwise not prohibited will fall into this lower-risk status uh, and therefore triggers a lighter framework, which predominantly focuses on transparency requirements but not only transparency requirements, transparency requirements as a minimum requirement. So um, let's just plow through. It's important to note that some of the language that's used in the AI regulations talks about prohibitions. And it's about prohibited AI practices, not necessarily the AI itself. So it's all about how you use the technology and the pro prohibitions 
again, the regulation will go into much more detail at how this strikes at specific AI practices, such as, for example, uh, those that are deemed to create an unacceptable risk. Risks, for example, that violate fundamental rights. So risks or, or use cases such as AI-based dark patterns, those that materially distort a person's behavior or AI-based micro-targeting, uh, those that, that, that exploit the vulnerabilities of a group of people or people within that specific group. If you are caught by the high-risk AI systems, um, then there's a classification system that applies. And the first classification or the category within that classification covers AI systems that are intended to be used as a safety component of products uh, or which otherwise are covered by the EU product safety legislation, such as the medical devices regulation. The second category within this classification framework covers standalone AI systems where their use could impact on fundamental rights. Now, if you are caught by this high-risk AI system framework, then there is a whole framework that applies. And the framework looks at issues such as transparency, security, accountability, risk management, testing, and this is really important because it features quite heavily human oversight. And so all of these come with their own framework. And, and sadly, we don't have time to go through all of that today, but you can see that there are interesting overlaps with other regulatory regimes, but also additional new requirements that start to come into play. So security, for example, where you have to demonstrate that there is a high level of accuracy, robustness and security that has to feature as a core part of the system. If there is a vulnerability, you may need to report that. It's a question if the vulnerability also impacts on personal data, whether there's dual reporting that goes on. Under the accountability that I mentioned, a system has to be put into place whereby you register on an EU database that you're using a high-risk AI system. So you need to register that as well. There's also concepts such as an authorized representative. So if you are outside of the jurisdiction and using and deploying AI, particularly high risk AI within the jurisdiction, then similar to the concepts that you have of an authorized representative within GDPR, you have to have an authorized representative under the AI regulation. So a lot to consider as far as this framework is concerned, particularly with high risk. Low risk, as I mentioned, really does focus on transparency. And transparency is required as a minimum. You are expected to show, even for low risk AI systems, that you are aiming for some of the key controls and obligations and governance that the high risk talks to as well. So it's not simply a get out of jail card by saying purely we're low risk and therefore we are subject to a lighter regime. It's a lighter regime as a minimum baseline only. What does this mean in terms of enforcement? The AI regulation provides for the establishment of a new European Artificial Intelligence Board, an EAIB, European Artificial Intelligence Board. This board will advise and assist European Commission in relation to matters covered by the AI regulation. So clear parallels again between the European Artificial Intelligence Board and what we see in terms of the role of the European Data Protection Board and how that has a role vis-a-vis -vis the European Commission and clarity guidance around uh, uh, consistency of the application of GDPR. So similar roles here. Member states must also designate national competent authorities. So we're looking at national regulators being appointed in this context as well. And again, we'll have to be very careful about where the overlap occurs, depending on whether whether one or two regulators potentially have oversight around your particular activity. I mentioned sanctions. Um, yeah, sanctions are quite important. Infringement of the AI regulation is subject to monetary sanctions. Now, currently, as it's drafted of up to between 10 and 30 million euros, depending on the nature of the infringement, or if it's higher, a turnover-based fine. And there's a range being proposed at the moment between 2 and 6% of global annual 
turnover. So the air regulation will be enforced, as I said, by supervisory authorities and national supervisory authorities. Important distinction between AI regulation and the framework and GDPR is unlike GDPR, the AI regulation does not provide for a complaint system or direct enforcement rights by individuals. Now, I appreciate that's just a very, very quick run through, and we will be looking at this topic in much more detail. In fact, if you want to, you can tune into our webinar dedicated purely to this topic next Tuesday. So the outline I presented, uh, however rushed it's been, hopefully will have demonstrated that the AI regulation will impact the farmer and broader, broader life sciences sector, especially as we are further increasing the use of AI, and it remains to be seen whether providers and users, et cetera, will consider the new framework as maybe a dissuading force, as one to maybe slow down the use and integration of AI, or whether actually this is just the price to be paid. It's another layer of compliance that has to be taken seriously and has to be uh, adhered to to make sure that the use of AI as a technology can be uh, used comfortably within the pharma sector. I wanted to talk very briefly also about anticipating cyber security risks. And again, we have uh, have quite a lot of content available on our global data, as Sally mentioned, around cyber security. But there's just a few key points I wanted to mention in this regard. And pharma as an industry and as, as a sector is no more immune than any other sector when it comes to cyber security risk. And in fact, it's arguable that the pharmaceutical industry and many reporters do suggest that the industry has access to some of the most critical data available. And that coupled with the industry's strict privacy guidelines, particularly around safeguarding protected health information, highlights a need for very effective cybersecurity management programs. And there are lots of reasons to keep this firmly focused and in mind. There are threat points that are very, very specific to pharma. There are reasons for attack that are very, very specific to pharma. And the moment that you start to establish and look deeper into the vendor and the ecosystem that's relevant to pharma, then you'll start to see that there are lots of touch points which are exposed to a cyber risk. You'll also start to see that this is an industry which is also not immune to the lot of uh, uh, talk and commentary at the moment about the threat of ransomware, as are the other key threats that we see, such as phishing attacks, uh, the risk of IoT, uh, the Internet of Things, and also the ever-increasing employee and insider threats. And many of the reports that we see, particularly some of those that are focused on this industry in particular, will rate the employee and insider threat certainly as one of the top three, if not top five threats as far as cybersecurity is concern. So a lot to be aware of as far as that concern. The key, of course, is preparation, preparation, and preparation. Data audits have a huge place beyond the data orbit audits that we all thought were painful exercises approaching the GDPR date of 2018. Data audits will give you that power of visibility to understand what data you have and to allow you to use it as a tool to understand what data, understand the framework of security and accountability that applies to the data, then allow you to prioritize the risk and understand how you need to have a framework of breach readiness that is relevant to your organization. And that is very key. When you're talking to regulators and regulators, have a role here. Regulators often know about data breaches probably the same time as you do. And sometimes before you do, we have many clients that will say, we've just been told by a regulator that we have a breach because actually this is already in the press or the public domain. So and we don't have time to go into a lot of this at the moment, but anticipating cybersecurity risks, this means there is a an elevated importance around the use of IT forensics, and particularly as a readiness tool, as a preparation tool, but also a tool that you invoke as part of your knowing your threat environment, but also as a key part of your response plan. Incredibly relevant to the first four hours 
certainly the first 24 hours of a breach and most likely within the first 48 hours too as you then start to move from understanding the threat that you've just encountered the risk that's crystallized and how you then have to talk to regulators about that naturally there is a whole world of damage that can occur and arise much of that is talked about in public already reputation damage isn't talked about enough we see so much damage and that is inflicted as a result of the reputational impact and so that has to be a key part of your cyber plan as does group litigation risks um, the environment of data breaches is certainly not immune to that um, chasing of the ambulance that we see in many other sectors so group litigation risks or the sort of class action that we see in the US, for example, around data breaches, we are seeing that in the UK and beginning to see some of that in Europe. It's not quite the same as a class action, but group litigation is absolutely a very serious risk to have. And of course, state sponsored attacks are on the increase as well. So the stakes are incredibly high. So being prepared, having a plan, having forensics, uh, and and having the tools at your disposal, such as legal privilege and instruction of, of, of IT forensics, will allow you to be better placed depending on the risk that actually hits you. The stakes are incredibly high, and Alison talked about that at the beginning of the section. You know, we've become a society where we want to know what's on the next slide, please. Uh, we want to be much more aware about what's happening in the press, particularly where our data concern. There is much more public perception about being aware of what's happening with your data as the debate around data sharing between the NHS and US tech is concerned at the moment. And of course, so the world is watching, the regulators are watching too. And as are the uh, the bad people out there, the, 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 the hackers and so on, there are increasing threat vectors to be aware of from that particular perspective. Just a final point as we hit up against time. Um, and I just wanted to really leave you on this thought because this is a topic that we are seeing around data ethics and diversity. It's a topic of growing interest and we don't have time to go into any detail at all, but I certainly wanted to make sure we just flag this as a point of consideration and just to allow you to think about where this fits into your organization. This is about going beyond the law and thinking about ethics. This is about shining a light on the unintended consequences of how your industry and pharma in particular goes about looking at data, data sets, the people involved in that, whether that's clinical trials or otherwise, making sure that there is a sense of diversity and equality in the data involved, because data is a currency for advancement of research and products and development. And having a diversity gap in that data population will flush through. Sadly, it might flush through at too late a stage uh, when, 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 when the products, for example, are already out in the market. And this is complex. Sharing is challenging. Innovation is challenging. And the use of AI, as we mentioned, is challenging. But there is a framework of law that has to be complied with, as well as the ethics and the broader debate that society has as far as equality is concerned too. Um, sorry, that's a very quick blast through those particular topics. Um, I did give you advance warning that we probably wouldn't have time to cover questions now at the end of this session, but both Sally and I are definitely around at the end of the session and, uh, and, and at the end of the networking sessions, and we'd be more than happy to talk to you at that stage about any questions you might have. Adrian, back to you. Thanks very much, Vin. <clears throat> that was great. Um, so much to chew on there. And your last point about data ethics, I think, really resonates, particularly over the last 12 months or so, the pandemic COVID period, where we've heard quite a lot in the news about underrepresentation of certain minorities in clinical trials at the same time where we've seen that that particular pandemic has um, has adversely affected certain ethnic groups much worse than others, and that that, that wasn't anticipated uh, because of that underrepresentation in the clinical trials. But I mean, just going back to Sally's start in relation to the 
um, update on cross-border transfers of data and the practical hints, very, very helpful there on how to manage the impact on project timetables or contract negotiations. I think the cybersecurity um, tips on how to deal with an incident, again, really topical. And I think this is a topic that keeps increasing numbers of C-suites awake at night. Um, it's certainly climbing up risk registers and the agendas of legal teams now, not just the CTO and, and the IT teams. And finally, the you know, thanks for fascinating insight on the AI regulation. Um, the parallels with the product safety and the medical device regime that you called out are certainly very striking, I think. Um, if this makes it onto the statute book, then it will be interesting to um, understand, I guess, how life science organizations will have to adjust. Uh, the potential for high risk AI systems in the pharma sector is, I think, obvious to everyone and no one will want to be the first to fall foul of the, the financial penalties that you've touched on. So thanks very much for that session.